Uh, my name is Sigal Bornir. I teach at HAT and in other academies in uh, Israel, as well as I'm a curator, a researcher, and I'm really thankful for being invited to moderate uh, this panel and uh, really appreciate the, the conference. I do think the design is a very good platform to discuss the uh, ethical, aesthetical, and operational consequences of AI, and, uh, and it was uh, marvelous up till now. And now we, we jump uh, quickly to uh, the next session, uh, which is more uh, project-based, uh, and uh, we have uh, like full program. We have three lectures. One of them is a collaboration, so is given by three lecturers. So I guess my hardest role will be to keep time, right, Yael? Yes. Uh, I'll do my best. And uh, if you have questions, please uh, put them on the Q&A. So hopefully we have a little time for uh, discussion as well. Like always, it's, it's the hardest part in conferences, right? So uh, uh, I start from uh, uh, presenting the, the first uh, uh, presenter is Lior Zalvanson, who is a senior lecturer at the Technology and Information Management Program at Tel Aviv University. His research interests include social media, online en engagement, commitment, internet, business models, creative experimentation, and more and more. Uh, is also the founder of the Print Screen Festival, Israel's Digital Culture Festival, and as he uh, uh, defines it in his parallel life, is also a, a, an artist and an activist and, and do a lot more. So, Lior, please, the floor is all yours. Hi, everyone, and uh, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here, and I'm, I'm really thanking the organizing committee for such a brilliant uh, conference and such an innovative one in this discussion. Um, we're proud to have it as part of uh, also in Israel, so to speak. It's not really Israel. It's Zoom. It's an international also, but you know what I mean. Um, I'm here to speak with you about the subject of accessibility. And I'm not actually going to share with you a lot of my academic work, uh, which is about uh, algorithmic management and the way algorithms control, in many cases, workers. But I'm going to focus more on my artistic work that in the last few years has focused mostly on the issue of do uh, algorithms, namely AI algorithms, actually uh, and make up on the promise of making the world a much more accessible place. Uh, and I'm going to share my slide. One second, please. I'm just going to just make sure you have sound and optimize for video. Okay, wonderful. Now I'm just going to start it. Okay. Yeah, this is the technical part with for each and every. PowerPoint slide deck. So uh, my talk starts from um, a press conference held by Google. I think it's almost uh, 15 years by now, in which Google then, well, bought YouTube. So it was YouTube and then Google. They announced the, um, basically the idea of automatic captions. It's something probably you've all noticed that you can use automatic captions when you watch YouTube videos to get a, a live um, transcription of uh, what's actually is being discussed on the screen. So this is basically a voice recognition, an AI enabled voice recognition algorithm. And my work uh, there, or my first work on the matter was actually a bit of a one liner. What I did is, in a work called accessibility is basically operate Google's algorithm on the press conference itself. Now note please that the press conference, if I remember correctly, is 2007. My work is from 2013. So six years have passed and still uh, the algorithm as you would see um, 
doesn't always work. Let's just uh, say it mildly, although in the beginning you'll notice it works quite nicely and then a lot of things happen. I hope this video is not of the best quality. Again, the video is quite old by now in modern terms, uh, but uh, let's hope you'll see it in an optimal manner. Sorry. All right. Good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Jonas Klink, and I'm the uh, product manager um, for the accessibility team here at Google. And um, we're very, very excited to have you guys here today. Um, I want to extend a really, really warm welcome and thank you all for, for coming here. Um, I know a lot of you are local, uh, but it's still early in the morning, and I'm, we're thrilled to have you here. I think we're um, going to have a, a great event today, and um, I look forward to showing you the demo that we have going today. So we're really thrilled to have Vin Cerf with us. Uh, his title here at Google is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist. Um, and, but as many as you know, he's, he's a lot more than that. He's uh, widely known as the father of the internet, um, as one of the co-designers of the TCP IP protocols and the basic architecture of the internet. Um, he, to us, um, which might be widely known, he's um, really, really critical uh, as an unwavering supporter for um, an accessible internet, um, and especially for those who have uh, special access needs. So, um, without further ado, we're really thrilled to have him here, and I give you Vince Surf. Everyone should know by this time that Google's uh, motto is to organize the world's information and make it accessible and useful. And accessible is a really important word in the context of what we're going to talk about today. So, uh, let me... Uh, uh, just give you a, a couple of examples of uh, the things that we do in Google applications or Google Apps. We've been focusing on keyboard access and the use of assistive, assistive technologies like screen readers to make the information available uh, more accessible to people who uh, can't see. Uh, we've released an Android uh, operating system for mobiles and our intent was to keep that as open as possible. It's an open source uh, operating system. People okay, so I'll stop here. But as you notice, some of the mistakes are really laugh out loud material because they sometimes even say the exact opposite of Google's motto, or as, as Vince Cerf says it, Google Cool's motto. Uh, and I found it, you know, my, my interest in it was, I was very interested in the Silicon Valley use of language, use of vocabulary and the performative element in Silicon Valley type of uh, press conferences. And I was really annoyed by the hubris and uh, so to speak solutionism as if Gany Morozov is saying that, that Google is going to solve and make the world a more accessible place. And I wanted to burst this bubble and I was super surprised how easy it is, how it just require operating the algorithm itself on the video. And again, this was not 2007, 2009, that was my mistake, but this work again is from uh, 2013. So four years have passed uh, for them improving the AI algorithm, improving the classification, and still those mistakes uh, occur quite frequently. I now notice that this specific video on YouTube actually has a correct version of subtitles that are not automatic anymore. So I don't know if they got the message across, if I got the message across by any chance, but today you'll find uh, the exact um, uh, transcription of the video. So, so, and I haven't seen you the shown you the part, but on the last mention of accessibility, the algorithm is translating this to accessibility. So my curiosity rose even more, and I was fascinated to learn that in many occasions, um, big platforms like the big five, Facebook and Google, just to give an example, are using accessibility as like the first beta testing of some cool AI technology. So here is voice recognition, for instance. And the second one I'm going to show you my project called Image May Contain from 2019 is about uh, image recognition. And in 2016, Facebook announced that they are using image recognition algorithms uh, to help the blind 
see or hear in this case, hear Facebook. So you know, there's all these text-to-speech algorithms or quite simple ones that just read out the text out loud. They are quite decent. But what happens when you suddenly uh, run into a picture? So they need image recognition to ensure accessibility and have the audience um, that cannot see, that has visual impairments, be able to participate in the Facebook experience. So immediately again, my hacking type of mentality, uh, try to find like the back door or the loop uh, to test this. Um, maybe it's not a hacker mentality, it's more of a QA mentality. Um, and I immediately started with a picture that is really infamous in Facebook because Facebook content moderation of taking this off the web, of course, because they were careful about the nudity of a small girl in here. And this is a very famous photo from the Vietnam War, uh, the chalk back, the, back in those days, the world uh, in which we see the girl running from the Naplem um, bombed village in Vietnam. This girl is still alive, and as I understood, she's uh, an advocate for peace. Um, but this image was just recognized on with the Facebook algorithm to be three people, people standing, child, sky, outdoor. So as you can see, maybe unsurprisingly, uh, the algorithm has stripped the picture, the image, from any uh, cultural, contextual understanding and meaning. And what I did is I looked at other pictures that I could find on the web that for that the Facebook algorithm has resulted in the same output, meaning the same sentence would have been read to the blind. Uh, so in this case, this picture <laughs> has resulted in the exact same sentence as the picture from the Vietnam War. It's also this picture. And of course we can see elements that are similar, right? We see children, in both photos, it's outdoor, true, we see the sky, but they are, of course, completely different. Um, and I wanted, by looking at those pictures, to understand what do algorithms see and what can they see, and are they really making the world more accessible, and in which way, or what choices they make for us regarding accessibility. So I'll give you a few more examples. So you see the number of people is sometimes wrong, but the sky is always there. The sky is maybe the easiest task of recognizing. Um, I'll do another example. 10 people car. I don't know, I, I can't see you at the moment. So I, and this is a webinar, so I won't make this interactive, but usually I ask kids, uh, not kids necessarily. I, I do this sometimes to, to high school kids, but my students as well, and just in conferences and I ask them, um, what photo do you think this is? And uh, Americans know it very easily and they always uh, come to the conclusion, by the way, it's not this one, but this was also 10 people car and not this one, also 10 people car, but it's actually this one. So 10 people car, I, I started with this total photo of the JFK pre-assassination photo. Uh, and again, not to mention that it gets the number of people wrong, it also doesn't reveal any historical meaning, any significance, because of course, not surprisingly, unsurprisingly, this is a very problematic, a very challenge task for an algorithm to fully understand the meaning. But again, what do we really gain by just having the number of people in this photo or by having a car, by having the um, main objects that are, I guess, the easiest task for algorithm at present time, but losing the entire meaning of this photo altogether. So these are also 10 people car. Um, I'll show you, I, okay, I'm running out of time. So I'll, I'll jump quite uh, fast. I, I did also one or more people ring that uh, unfortunately in this case, there was like a, kind of like a shock to me because it identified this photo from Rwanda a uh, very famous photo of the, uh, of the uh, crisis in Rwanda back in the 90s or the end of the 80s, I hope I'm not mistaken here. The end is so slim because of malnutrition that it was recognized as a ring. So this could be very awful in some cases, uh, the misidentification. And two people, three dog outdoor. This was actually my experiment of uh, not this photo. These are just examples that read the same thing. I actually started from this photo. 
of uh, the human rights uh, protests in Alabama um, back in the day. Um, so again, I think for activism purposes, but just for understanding the world, for us to communicate better, because I think Facebook's motto is making, you know, building better, more responsible communities at the moment. Uh, and I'm not sure these AI tools are actually increasing accessibility. If anything, they are just creating more, more filter bubbles and are shaping us in the form of the algorithmic limitation. Um, I'm just running quickly. I won't show you this. The MLK, Martin Luther King example, is also a Metallica concert, it's also Trump. But this is how it uh, was um, shown in the gallery. I used the technology called lenticular prints, which are kind of like the postcards you have at museums. Um, and this technique allowed me to have people enter the gallery and each object represented the same idea, the same sentence, the same output of the algorithm, but uh, different people saw different photos at different locations. So it kind of, it was like this. So this is the Hindenburg explode, exploding, but as you can see, when you move your body or when you move the camera, your eyes basically, you see different photos. A, each and every one of the images on an object are exactly the same in the eyes of the Facebook algorithm. Yeah, so I'm just going, to, I have very little time. I think I have like four minutes or so or six or five. I'm just going to tell you with you briefly that I'm also uh, have been involved in, again, voice recognition algorithms, trying to understand what um, bots or AI assistants uh, can or cannot understand when it comes to voice recognition. And I created this new uh, bot, uh, which teaches you a language called basic, basic English. And basic, basic English is uh, my research to understand what words in the English languages are words that are understandable, no matter which accent you use. My accent is kind of Hebrew heavy, but no matter which accent you use, this word will always be identifiable by the bots, by the, by the assistant AIs. And the idea is maybe, maybe for productivity sake, we should uh, take one step towards the bots and make the world more accessible by limiting, actually limiting our languages and kind of making us all sound like programming languages. So it's, it's a bit of a speculative project in this sense. And it's sort of inspired by the idea by C.K. Ogden in the 20s, a dictionary called Basic English. We actually have in the audience today, Mushon Zeravi, who just spoke earlier, and he introduced me to this dictionary in the first place. So Basic English was a controlled language in the, um, in the 20, 1920s for the British Empire, where they had this need to teach English very rapidly uh, to... Um, the people indigenous in the different countries, mostly in far Asia. And they basically what Ogden did is made English uh, to only consist of 850 words and suggested that complex words will be replaced by simpler sentences. So what I did is basically ran, ask a lot of uh, people from all around the world in places where basically British empire used to rule to read out loud Ogden's basic dictionary in those different accents. And then I ran it all through Silicon Valley speech recognition algorithms. So basically I tested the speech recognition algorithms to see which words they understand and which words they, um, they basically misunderstand, they misrecognize. And the result is actually a list of the 648 words that I named basic, basic English, the first language spoken by both digital and biological persons and understood by both. For example, in the new language, I think therefore I am by Descartes is just basically I, I. And if you can, it's actually quite funny in the sense it's quite minimal. It's really a controlled language. Um, I don't have a lot of time for examples, but this, this what, what I actually did, and uh, well, not unknowingly completely, but I didn't have any idea what will be the results coming into it. 
that the language, the new contoured language is, is the closest I've ever heard English to sound like a programming language. So in another example is that a lot of words that got erased from the dictionary are words that sound alike. So wait, sound like the word wait. I can't, <laughs> even when I pronounce it, they sound exactly the same. So no peace, no peace, um, and so on and so forth. So I don't have, unfortunately, the time to show you the video, but for those of you interested, um, my email is just my last name at gmail.com and I can send you the full video. Um, but I will conclude with the notion that um, I worry that accessibility is still very much a lip service in many cases in Silicon Valley's AI algorithm implementations. They mean well, I don't think there are bad people there. But I do think that for, uh, because it sounds like such a great PR, uh, they go and they celebrate solving accessibility and how great are we to the world. And in many cases, they are underlooking or they, are, don't, they don't recognize that what they really create are new limitations, new biases, and in many cases, new understandings of the world that are to some degree American-centric and limited um, in cultural and contextual essence. Uh, I'll finish here and I'll thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Lior. Open uh, new questions uh, to the arena now.